fall of 1962. Every review that has come out to date on the Enchanters has gotten it wrong. They tell you it's a Marilyn Monroe book. Bullshit. I didn't like her as a human being. I disliked her as an actress. She is but one of numerous real life and fictional players comporting in this book. Far more important are Lieutenant Daryl Gates of the LAPD's Intelligence Division, LAPD's greatest chief, William H. Parker, is a major character in this book, and a scurrilous Lebanese-American private detective named Freddy Otash. And all of this is a long way of saying that, in general, in the aggregate, I make all this shit up. <laughs> and I rewrite history to my own specifications. When I stick my snout into history, I am looking for only one thing. The absence of verifiable fact which permits me the latitude to fictionalize. Thus, this book is inaccurate in the extreme. <laughs> My books are 25% historical record and 75% deliberate distortion. Nobody knows <laughs> what Marilyn Monroe, my first television actress, true love, the great Lois Nettleton, were doing in the summer of 62. Nobody knows what Whiskey Bill Parker was doing in the summer of 1962, except running from the liberal press and getting shit-faced bombed at Parker Center, <laughs> the big police administration building that would one day honorably bear his name. Nobody knows what really happened with the suicide of stupid ass blonde bombshell, <laughs> Carol Landis, in July of 1948. I had nothing to do with her death because I was seven months old <laughs> at the time. And that's my alibi. I had a protein sexual drive, but seven months old is pressing it. If you can't crawl out, of your crib. So right now, Chevalier's bookstore in its latest incarnation, it's not the one way up the street there near the old Winchell's Donut Hut and Tom the Korean grocer. Uh -uh. It's not the one more or less directly across the street and a little bit south. It's the new and improved Chevalier's bookstore, still bearing the name of Old Nib Snout, Hated Children, <laughs> Joseph Chevalier. <laughs> Let's give a hand for Old John. <laughs> it's the year of the book. I might add. I don't have a computer. I don't write on a computer. I don't have a cell phone. I have a landline telephone. I don't take text messages. When I go someplace, I stay in a hotel, and when I make the reservation, the first thing I ask the clerk is, 
if you got the bedside phone where you can call in and people can call you and they can leave messages. It's because I live in the past. I have no opinions pertaining to anything in the popular culture. As far as I'm concerned, it's 1962, the events of 1962, the events that I describe in this book here, the events that I will go on to describe in the two sequels that I am writing to this book, which will comprise aggregate a micro history of LA in 1962, concern me deeply. And they will form my life's work until I write my largest book, my biggest book times 50%, which will be the story of BJ Day in Los Angeles, August 15th, 1945, told in real time. Now, I'm gonna read chapter one of The Enchanters. Then, it would honor me if all of you peepers, prowlers, pederasts, pedants, panty sniffers, punks, and pimps would ask me the most invasively over personal question <laughs> that each and every one of you can think of. James Elroy's greatest work of fiction, spawned by that look of post-postmodernism meets modernism, meets the 1962 Chevy Impala meets Whiskey Bill Parker, Marilyn Monroe, Lieutenant Daryl Gates, Greaseball Freddie Otash, Lois Nettleton, the 14 years dead Carol Landis, and a high school girl named Lowell Farr, who is based on the first woman of 13 that I proposed marriage to, the first to say no, <laughs> my junior high school classmate who later broke my heart by going to Hollywood High when I had to go to Fairfax High, Gail Miller. She was working as a stewardess and she met a Jordanian. They fed him the threats the Carnoys, The View, he's Morris, Herschel, Buzzy Stein, WMA, age 42. His per sheet dates back to 1938. He's a stat rapo and a psycho snap diver. Danforth and Stein were bought and paid for, kidnapped was a gas chamber bounce. The gig was strictly rogue and ad-lib. Here's the gist. A B-movie actress named Gwen Perloff got strong arm snatched. It was late a.m. today. She lived in a cheese lux building up from the strip. Three men grabbed her on the sidewalk. They wore Fidel Castro masks. Multiple eyewits saw them. They shoved her into a double parked vehicle and jammed south. Said vehicle might have been a 58 Dodge or a 56 Chevy Nomad. Miss Perla plays second leads in horror and dance craze flicks. She's a 20th century Fox contract slave. The strip is county turf. The LA sheriff caught the squaw, but, 
fox kingpin, Daryl Zanuck, got tipped off. Some unknown woman called him. She freaked Danforth and Stein out and spilled one of their two girl stash locations. Zanuck called his tight pal, Bill Parker. Chief Bill boot Jack a kidnap job. He said, dispatched Freddie and the hats to a house off a of sixth and Dunsmuir. We grabbed Stein and Danforth. Perloff was stashed elsewhere. Stanforth and Dine refused to dislodge the spot. Stein said there were three more snatch men still out there. They pulled the job, not him and Richie. Stein zipped it then. Harry and Eddie walked him with sap gloves. Stein kept it zipped. Ditto Danforth. That man dated the death threat and the freeway drop show. I held Danforth's right arm. Max held his left arm. Red jammed his head down and force fed him looksies. Max went, where's the girl? Red went, give it up or you fly. Harry, Eddie, and Per Dog Stein stood 10 feet back from the drop. It was late LA, hot and humid. Max and Red sweated through their shirts and suit coats. Danforth wriggled and squirmed. He dug his feet in and thrashed. Dirt clods skidded off the cliff. The fucking drop loomed. <laughs> I scoped Max and Red. They looked impatient. I clamped Danforth's arm. He buckled against me. My hand went numb. My legs fluttered. Max and Red ran 6'4 and 240. Their legs fluttered. Red said, you're wearing us thin, Richie. We can't keep this up all night. Tell us where the girl is so we can walk out of here. Danforth giggled and spit on red shoes. He said, I'm having fun. I slid on brass knucks and kidney punched him. He stifled a screech and dug his feet in. I looked over the cliff. Car zigged by fast with no let up. Max sighed, Red sighed. Max said, sink him, Freddy. They dropped their hands. I shoved Danforth off the cliff. He treaded air for one split second. It's a put up job, came out garbled. I heard him hit a car roof. I heard brakes squeal. I heard wheels stump over him. Crisscross headlights hit him. A pimp mobile caddy dragged him against a guardrail and sheared off his feet. <laughs> In a phrase, this is why I love the Los Angeles Police Department. <laughs> because every once in a while, there's some motherfucking rapist, child molester, hot prowl, kidnapping piece of shit. And he's just gotta go. <laughs> Questions?
Back hook. Your language has always been, like you say, you, you are of another time. Yeah. This is your language. Yeah. Um, you write in the slang of the time that you're mm -hmm. like writing about. Is this, does this come from memory? Do you make it up? Is it part of your research of, of the era? How are you reminded of this language and the slang? I make it up. <laughs> I recall the era. I lived with my dad following my mother's death seven years until his death when I was 17. And he was a big, good looking, extremely profane guy. And I learned the language of disparagement from him. The best thing ever written about me was written by the jurist critic David T. Bazelon, probably two decades before I was born. <coughs> and he was describing the art of Dashiell Hammett. And he said, the core of Hammett's art is the masculine figure in American society. He is primarily a job holder. He goes at his job with a bloodthirsty determination, which proceeds from an unwillingness to go beyond it. This relationship to the job is perhaps typically American. The idea of doing or not doing a job competently has replaced the whole larger issue of good and evil. That's a long way of saying that Dashiell Hammett and I comprise the alpha and the omega of the American hard-boiled novel. His novel, his first novel, Red Harvest, was published in 1929. My ultimate novel, my greatest novel, The Enchanters, was published or will be published tomorrow. You are among the elite because this is D-Day minus one. <laughs> we are all about American men, their fears, their loves, their loathing, and their insatiable desire to fall in love with strong women. That's everything that I'm about, everything that Hammett was about. It is a primer on why Hammett was exponentially greater than Raymond Chandler, because Hammett wrote the man that he was afraid he was, whereas Chandler wrote the man that he wanted to be. And the harshness of my language is the core of my art. It's why I am not now, nor will ever be magnanimously reviewed. It's why this book will be misunderstood probably more than most of my previous books. It's because it's about that level of maleness, of disparagement, and it's about a time past, a time that slid into yet another iteration of modernism in the early 1960s. <laughs> Sir, yes. Oh, me? Yeah, yeah, you're next. Oh, okay. uh, I asked the presence of two uh, judges who work in the criminal courts. Um, do you know cops, and do you think the criminal justice system is fair? I don't know. 
because it's contemporary. And I don't know. <laughs> More, moreover, I, I don't care. I don't think about it. Yeah. I'll tell you that I vaguely know that Joseph Biden is the president of the United States and followed <laughs> Donald Trump, who followed Barack Obama. I can trace American presidents back to the turn of the 20th century, but I don't know shit. I know that they don't use the green room at San Quentin Prison nearly as much as they should. <laughs> and I mourn the day they went from the hot seat to lethal injection. Yeah, boss. Uh, you ever relate your writing to music? And, and what I mean by like, is like uh, your early style was, and I love the early books. I'm, I'm talking like I told you yeah. that at that time, you know, going back that far, Killer on the Road and stuff like that. Your style wasn't as musical in a way as it eventually, I think, at least, it became. Your style definitely became almost like a certain kind of uh, minimalist music. It's not minimalist. It is harsh in the extreme. It's concise in the extreme. It's written either in the third person subjective style, where in alternating chapters you have three or four viewpoints. In four viewpoints, it's three men and one woman. In three viewpoints, it's three men. And you only see what they see and you think through their mind's eye, and it's they, 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 as opposed to I, 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 when I write in the first person, like I do here. There are no tricks, and it's not minimalistic. I love jazz, I love bebop, most of all. I love classical music more than I love jazz. I love 20th century chamber music and symphonic music. I love the romantic composers, Beethoven up to 1910, 1911, say through the death of Mahler, most of all. But I don't listen to music, except when I'm sitting down and listening to music. Sir. In your writing routine, do you like write in the morning? Do you type? Do you go a certain number of hours and then stop writing? I write by hand. I've written all my books by hand. I write on white notebook paper with black ballpoint pen. I correct in red ink. The outline for the Enchanters was 425 pages. I had it typed up. And there it is. This book is as concise and dense and artful as it is because I outline, it's a first person novel, it's 448 pages long in hardcover, it's 130,000 words. It's not as long as my three and four viewpoint third person books. So, since Freddie Otash is in every scene and thinking everything out, I thought it down to a paragraph micro level and elaborated Freddie's every thought to tell you how he came to the conclusions that he comes to in this book and why he does the violence and occasionally very tender things that he does. That's how I do it. It's all thought out in advance. Sir, you, boss. Uh, what is your relationship to your characters as you're writing, and does it change? No. <laughs> Never trust an author who says, <laughs> my characters they go off in their own, their own direction. And you know, and I'm like, it's a bunch of bullshit. You know why? Because they don't exist. Outside your mind, your pen, your word processor, or whatever thing you write with. What the person 
really means when they say, well, my right, my characters just go off and do things that I never had in mind for them. They have a life of their own. I'm just a vessel for my characters. It means that they were confronted with narrative options and they took one that ended up surprising them. They're being disingenuous. No. I start out, I write the book exactly as it is. No. What, you mean people coming after? All the people I write about are dead. <laughs> and their relatives, their loved ones, they have no legal recourse. Do you think they read you? Yeah, some do, most of them don't. Like people on this earth, some of them do, most of them don't. Right. Yes? Mr. Allen. Call me Dog, it's an old nickname. <laughs> dog, if you are not participating in the contemporary world, yeah. has anything improved and have relationships between men and women changed or stayed the same? Mine have. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. If I'm back in LA, there's, there's only one of three reasons. A woman just divorced me. That's number one. <laughs> Two, I had to get my ass into rehab quick. And there you go. That's the second one. And then three, or I have a new book out. <laughs> this woman gave me her phone number 10 years ago, and I never called her. I never said I was smart. <laughs> Just tall, dashing, and good looking. I assumed you just didn't have your landline plugged in. <laughs> I, I never unplug it. I never unplug it. Yeah. Because you never know who call. Okay. Maybe next time. Yes, Doc. Doc. I'm yeah. very happy that you have the losers in your front. Uh, have you heard of the Losers Club in yes, the Waterhouse? Yes, I have. Yes. And uh, I, I, we all know about your intensity, your love. Your violence, your, I think a lot of times the media focuses on your persona and, and the demon dog is not perceived as, as humorous as I really think you are. So I was wondering which comedians were influential to you growing up, if there was anybody that was really. I can't think of a comedian that makes me laugh. I just like screwball comedy. I thought Lenny Bruce was tremendously unfunny. <laughs> Don Rickles, the insult comics. And Don Rickles used to appear at the Losers Club. When he's writing comedically before comedy took over his entire ooh to, to its great detriment, there was very, very, very funny shit in Joseph Wambaugh's early novels. The two funniest groups of people that I have ever met were black jazz musicians and white LA cops. The funniest motherfuckers that ever breathed. And it's all male bullshit that goes back to David T. Bazelon anointing Elroy not yet born and canonizing Dashiell Hammett. It's the shit that men talk about when no one else is listening. Yes? Why did you leave Los Angeles? Well, uh, my first ex-wife wanted to live in Connecticut. Yeah. Yeah. So you went for a girl? Shit, yes. 
<laughs> yeah, but you know what it cost me? Hmm. The dog who would become my first ex-dog. Ah, <laughs> uh, does anybody know who Jim Aubrey was? Come on, probably every son of a film biz crowd, isn't it? I mean, Jim Aubrey. No, nobody knows who Jim Aubrey was. Jim Aubrey was a big, big TV producer in the 50s and the 60s. And Jackie Suzanne wrote her Romana play novel, <laughs> The Love Machine, about Jim Aubrey. And occasionally, circa 1979, 1980, when I was just start, started to write my first novel, Brown Shore Quinn, I was a caddy at Bel Air Country Club across the street from UCLA. And Aubrey was an old guy then, and he used to play with this group of stiffs called the Dawn Patrol. They paid very low scale, but they got out on a golf course at first light and played really fast. And there was a man, you know, Polish surname. He was a gruff guy. His first name was Frank. And he was squawking about his upcoming divorce. And Jim Aubrey said, you fucking ungrateful cocksucker. Shut your fucking mouth. There is only one issue in a divorce, and that's who gets the dog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah! Pops there is old enough to recall Jim Aubrey when he's not saying anything. That's you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> sir. Jim Aubrey of Aubrey Shake Productions? I don't know. I don't know. He would be already wise, but. Yeah. No, this is a long time ago. Sir. Uh, when you talked about still living in 1962, I was wondering what you'd do to reimmerse yourself in that period. I think I read you rewatchable TV programs from that era. Um, I, I watch boxing. Helen and I watch boxing on TV. We're fanatical boxing fans. And I will watch any cheesy film noir. Film noir ended, by the way, in 1961. So calling my books noir and calling novels written today noir and movies made today. That's a, a lot of hooey. That's all hard boiled. But holy shit, Crime Wave, 1952. That's really Brand Boulevard in Glendale. And those are real 1952 cars. I get my rocks off that way. And nobody gets hurt, so far as I can tell. Is that the Sterling Hayden movie? Pardon me? Crime Wave. Is that the Sterling Hayden movie? Sorry, yeah, Sterling Hayden's in it. Yeah. It's the, it's the best cop performance I've ever seen. And if Russell Crowe you know, had balls, you know, bigger than the size of a peanut, and a soul, you know, <laughs> thicker than a tortilla, you know, he would have been, and it was a foot taller, he would have been a Jim Dandy Bud White in the light confidential. But the ideal Bud White in the light confidential, the movie, if the movie were worth a shit, would have been Sterling Hayden from Crime Wave. Ah. Patrick. So which actor, I don't give a shit if they're alive or dead, is going to play the demon dog of American Letters? <laughs> Me? <laughs> I mean, I don't know. And no, nobody's likely to make my memoir, My Dark Places, anytime soon, and it's a fellow had a, an option. I don't know. Let me think about it. Let me think about it. Yeah. 
I'll have an answer for you by the end of the evening. <laughs> Keep going. Come on, come on. Yeah, Anna Magnani, back there. Babe, it's you. Bambina. Yeah. Did you know you were running a trilogy when you were getting out? Uh, no. I started out to write the second L.A. Quartet, taking characters from the original L.A. Quartet, The Black Dahlia, The Big Noir, L.A. Confidential, and White Jazz, and the Underworld USA trilogy, American Tableau, The Cold 6000, and Bloods of Rome. So those books cover 1943 to 1972. I was gonna take characters from those two extended bodies and put them in LA during World War II as much younger people. I wrote the first two novels, Perfidia, which is the month of Pearl Harbor in real time, and then the direct sequel, The Storm, which takes us into May of 1942, when I decided they are the first two books of the L.A. Quintet, one of five. So The Enchanters is the third, the pivotal book of the L.A. Quintet. There are two more to go in my micro history of 1962 LA, and they will refract World War II crimes. I'm not giving much away here. You'll learn it early on in the text of the Enchanters, but what the Enchanters refracts real life historical is the post-war venereal disease boom. Yeah. <laughs> Widespread panic is not part of this no, that has nothing to do with it. Oh. It was, it's three novellas that also, and they're comedic novellas, mm -hmm. that also feature pretty Sorry. Apologize to my wife first, but why do you hate masturbate to Marilyn Monroe? Why do I hate masturbate? Read the book. <laughs> read the book. <laughs> read the book. <laughs> but I'm just curious. Read, read the, the book. Is. You gotta read the book. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's something I'm not going to answer now. <laughs> read the book. Fair. Yeah. You gauge the portrayal. And the one other question I never answer is what's real, what's not. I am out to create verisimilitude, not a record that's a fact. So what's your research process like? Like where do you start looking for that, the, the gaps in the historical record? I read Anthony Summers's biography, Goddess, a biography of Marilyn Monroe. Gosh. Saw the gaps in chronology, Saw the conflicting account, didn't even finish half the book. Lost it. I hate it. <laughs> if you can't make it up, get a job. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they've got my old slot at Bel Air Country Club just waiting for me to come back. <laughs> Someone else said their heads up. Yeah. Can I ask why you uh, seem to have a reserve a particular ire for Orson Welles in your books? And, uh... I never liked him. I think he's full of shit. I think, I think Citizen Kane is full of shit. Uh, I, you know what I think? I think Robert Altman's film Nashville is the single greatest American movie. And I think it's the movie that, although it came out, 24 years earlier, that Citizen Kane purports to be. Is Altman your favorite filmmaker? No. Really? Someone of whom is, I like it. Who's but it's like me in a bottle, that's for sure. Who's your favorite filmmaker? I don't have one. You want, you want to know who I really think is full of shit? 
Martin Scorsese. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know the actors I hate the most? Robert De Niro, Al Pacino. You know the TV auteurs I hate the most and the TV shows I hate the most. I hate The Wire. I hate all that David Simon bullshit guys sitting around talking shit. Yeah, it's bad. It's bad. Oh, shit. Paul. What about raw movies? If you were going to recommend a noir movie to somebody perhaps didn't know that. A noir? If I were going to recommend a noir movie? To people who didn't quite know. Weren't that familiar with them? It's a noir. Well, first 45 minutes. Of, of Out of the Past, to the best film model I've ever seen. And then it goes to shit, it gets very complex, and you lose track of the story. Only the first 45 minutes. Why? It ain't, it ain't about nothing but a man and a woman. Yeah, and you know, they had some good looking people back then. You know, Robert Mitchum, James Rare. Hard, hard not to go for one of those two. <laughs> Robert Mitchum's one regret in life, he wasn't me. <laughs> your, your mom, she was from Wisconsin, right? Yeah. What, which part? Tacoma. Tacoma, Wisconsin. Oh, okay, but it was Cambria. Was, uh, no. I spent a lot of time there, so I didn't know that. Yeah. Typical outright crowd. Very, <laughs> very few women ask questions. Andrew. So now that you've been out of LA for so long, what's it like when you come back to your it's, What a shithole. I mean, it's just, it's just, it was slum. It's dirtier, it's filthier, it's smoggier, there's more automobiles, there's more winos and, and shitheads and street creeps and junkies on the street than ever before. Yeah. Uh, it ain't the LA I remember. We said it we ain't even the semi, Elroy. what? We said we were gonna make it more Elroy. <laughs> what? <laughs> but you, you, you see, here, Patrick, here's what people don't realize. I'm the most wholesome guy in the world. I'm the most law-abiding monogamous guy in the world. If you look at these books, one thing, the one thing that I would most like to be remembered as is as a Christian novelist. Belief runs through these books. You see it in the epigraph from Psalms, the 31st Psalm here. You see it in the epigraph or from the book of Proverbs in my book, Porphidia. You see it in my moral sense. Yeah. I was on an airplane flying from LA to New York 30 some years ago. I got into a conversation with a rabbi, and he said something to me I've never forgotten. If God came back to earth today, he has one message for all of us. You are responsible. Next question. <laughs> Do you take no pleasure at all in Chandler? Do I take no pleasure in what? In Chandler. No. 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 <laughs> I did when I was a kid. Oh, yeah, this shit. Oh, Paul Marlowe, he's bad to the bone. Yeah, he's the bee's knees. You know, he's riding around the 39 Buick. Yeah, all women want him. Yeah. He's on the juice, but he doesn't show it, like me. Yeah, passed out in the Wilshire drunk tank. I take no pleasure in Chandler. But Ross McDonald, oh, what a bore. He's absolutely insufferable. And I read that shit when I was a kid. Oh, he's so sensitive. Oh, he's the father to this whole misbegotten baby boomer generation. Try reading one of his books today. 
Yeah, Mr. Waterhouse. Raising your hand? Yeah, I was going to ask about the uh, the opposite of these. I read your bit about Crown Liquors paperback rack. And I yeah, wanted you Crown to, Liquors. I wanted you to, to ex uh, expose the audience to your favorites. The, the, the Nymphomaniacs, the, uh, there was a great list that you had there. Exactly. Crown Liquors was at the corner, it was the northwest corner of Melrose and Ridgewood. I mean, I grew up in Lower Hollywood, just, you know, Beverly Boulevard, right down the street from here. And I went there because they had these books that years later, urged me on to write this, my greatest work of fiction, right here. I got, in the early 60s, I got a couple of early, early Irving Wallace books, like, I remember, I got the Chapman Report there, his novelization of the Kinsey Report, and I got Harold Robbins's great Romana play about Howard Hughes, Carpetbaggers at Crown Liquor. And they also had a semi dirty rack with, they would be the equivalent, the television equivalent of a soft core erotic thriller from 20 some years ago with Shannon Tweed or Joan Severance. <laughs> That's what they would have been. And here are some of the titles. The Gynecologist, <laughs> The Call Girls, The Nymphomaniacs, The Swingers, The Stewardess, and on and on and on. Hence, this book is not The Chapman Report, not The Stewardesses, not The Gynecologist or The Call Girls, but The Enchanters. This book is homage because it's 2023, I turned 75 and I'm anointed like 2023, the year of the book. Because of my birthday, I get the Robert Kirsch Award and this book coming out. Yes? You mentioned not liking Marilyn Monroe. I'm curious what you found most distasteful no, about that. No, I'm not answering that. You read the book. Okay. <laughs> I signed the book for you. You got it right there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, one more Um. Okay. You, 1962, what's a typical Thursday night? What would you have been doing? <laughs> I lived with my dad over here at Beverly and Irving. We had an unhouse broken beagle. Uh, it was, she was malodorous. I thought, I love her. I, you get in order to the smell. You become just another dog. Yeah, I just, you know, happened to be a biped dog rather than a, you know, than a quadruped dog. A no, typical Thursday night, 1962. Well, there might have been a rewrite of 77 Sunset Strip on TV. I'd read a Roma on a clay job that I got at Crown Liquor, or a book I took out of the Bushel Branch Library at Council and St. Andrews, or I would take my hound dog for a walk out of Lower Hollywood into Fat City, Hancock Park. Long, long, long walk and peep windows. <laughs> you want to know why there are so many voyeur private eyes and cops in my books? There you go. So I was a fucking peeper. <laughs> and I talked to a fella in Denver, a fella I go to church with. He's a very close friend of mine, Tom Stover, mm -hmm. one, uh, who's a lawyer. He's a lawyer for Big Tobacco, too. In case, you know, in case I want to get anybody's ire up right here. <laughs> we go to church together and lunch every Sunday. I said, Tom, you never peeped? And he just, I said, he said, no. And I said, why? <laughs> why? He said, if you have to ask, you're never going to know. I thought about that for a while. And why 
what were you wearing? <laughs> what was I wearing? Yeah, when you were peeping. Well, I was always wearing back then, which was white Levi cords. It was cold out. I was wearing a Pendleton shirt. I was wearing black and white saddle shoes. Maybe a crew neck sweater or a white shirt. It hasn't changed much. <laughs> Yes, sir. Of all the folks in real life that you met as far as making them characters in your books, like Freddie Otas or Dick Fontino, were there any in hindsight that you wish I had never met them or any regrets on that? No. No. I didn't like Freddie Otash. But here, there you go. It's got the F on the spine for fiction. <laughs> Tell me Dick Fontino was cool at least. Dick Fontino was okay. I'm going to get accordion. What do you want? Go <laughs> more. <laughs> yeah. 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 Look, Sir. Uh, who was the character? Who was the real person? Spade Cooley. He was like a guitar player? He was a violin player. He was a violin player. Yeah. yeah. A country western band leader. Beat his wife to death in 1961. Went to prison. Was out on work for a while performing for some deputy sheriffs, killed over a heart attack. Because he features in a lot of your books. Yeah, he's in a lot of the short stories too, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah sir. What made you think that you could live this life as a writer initially when you started out? Did you think, I've got something that's important to say? And no, to say? I, I just had, I just had a story I wanted to tell that became my first novel, Brown's Requiem. The protagonist looks like me, loves classical music like me, uh, has a job repossessing cars, which I very briefly had. Grew up around Beverly Boulevard and Western Avenue, which I did. There you go. And then was caddying. I was caddying at Beller Country Club at the time, and there's a lot of country club golf caddy stuff in that book. I had that story to tell. It wasn't about <coughs> assuming identity, I didn't have a political agenda. I just wanted to write that book uh, and get people to, to dig on it. And I wrote another one, I wrote another one. <laughs> Couple more questions. Hey. Hey. Anna. Hey. Hey. <laughs> Anywhere in LA besides this haunted bookstore that you can still love? Well, I tore down the Pacific Nine Cup. <laughs> Downtown at Six and Whitmer. Uh, they, they may resurrect it. Get it declared a historical site. Uh, I love Hollywood High School, even though I didn't go there out to Fairfax. I couldn't, I couldn't get into Hollywood High, but that's okay. Gail Miller did. Well, <laughs> so often my dark places. Pardon me. All these years later, after my dark places, and you reopen the investigation into your mother. No, there's, there's nothing. I'm never going to find out who killed my mother. Uh, I don't get phone calls anymore. I don't have a 1 800. It's over. Done. Yeah, done. Couple more questions. Don't all raise your hands. <laughs> Yes, yeah, sir. What was your method of shoplifting that worked the best? <laughs> Stick a book yep. or a steak down my waistband. When no one was looking. Yeah. <laughs> Noted. Yeah. Did you ever get caught? Yeah, numerous times. <laughs> Numerous times. Uh, I got caught in the summer of 64. My friend Glenn Martin loved 
who's a retired uh, LAPD man, loves his story. So I'm 64, uh, 64. And uh, I was drinking already. And I sold a bottle of wine at the locale of the CVS drugstore across the street here, a little bit north, which was a Safeway back mm -hmm. then. And I took off walking, fast walking, it was right over here. Uh, and boom, southbound on the Larchmont toward First Street. And I heard pop, 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 pop behind me. Store guy ran out, tackled me. I went belly first on the sidewalk. The bottle of wine broke right here, right waistband. I still got the scar. It was a tough process of recovery. Did I learn anything? No. <laughs> Did I keep stealing? Yes. The last time I stole something. This is one of the reasons I love LAPD to the extent that I do. It's because they kicked my fucking ass on three notable occasions, deserved on all three occasions. And the last time involved a big bag of triple you know, pillowcases filled with coins that I had jimmied out of a you know an apartment house laundry room <laughs> at Fifth and St. Andrews in Wilshire District Quarters Dives and Nichols. I was able to get rid of them. It's a long, long story, but they filled out an FI car field interrogation car <clears throat> on me and uh, I was living in a dump at Third and Wilton. Knock, knock. Next day, two detectives, they were from, they were burglary desk guys from the old Wilshire Division on Pico and Rimpark. Knock, knock. And hey, Studley, come here. And they were these classic white flat top haircut, five foot 11, 210 pound guys. And they said, we know you did it. Yeah, you know, we saw all the coins bulging out of your pockets. <laughs> and we got the FI card here that the patrol guys submitted. So you got to ride on this one. Just don't do it again, okay? Just be smart because we'll know it's you next time and it won't go so easy. So I they started to walk away. But I was never smart. I was never smart and I had a good mouth. And I was never tough either. And I was never tough and I was never smart. And I said, fuck you. And they looked at each other. And they share this sad. <laughs> Some guys just never learn. And the bigger of uh, the two guys came up, and it was the left hook right there that traveled about this far. Left hook to the right side, right here, and hit me right there. And I went down, and all the breath went out. And for the six, seven, eight minutes it took me to get my breath back, I wish I were dead. It was the most intense pain that I ever been through. And I had my ass kicked before, and I have not stolen so much as a paper clip since then, and that was the fall of 1973. Does anyone want to ask me concludingly, why do you write? You can, you can all ask it at the same time. Too. <laughs> why do you write? Why do you write? Why do you write? Why do you write? Why? Just one more time. Why? Why? In my craft or sullen art, 
exercised in the still night, when only the moon rages and the lovers lie abed with all their griefs in their arms, I labor by singing light, not for the strut and trade of charms upon the ivory stages, but for the common wages of their most secret heart. Not for the proud man apart do I write on these spindrift pages, but for the lovers, their arms round the griefs of the ages, who pay no praise or wages, nor heed my craft or art. Dylan Thomas. Thank you, God bless you. Come on, boy, come on, I trust you.